Uh, an early ticker. It's never too early for a daily ticker. Brought to you by Pelican Brewing Company. Visit pelicanbrewing.com for more details on locations, events, and award-winning beers independently brewed since 1996. Pelican Brewing, born at the beach. Our good friend Jesse Simonton of On3.com has got a few articles up from the SEC Spring Media Session. He joins us now early. He's on Twitter, at Jesse R.E. Simonton. Give him a follow. One of the best uh, college football national writers out there. Jesse, good morning. Thanks for hopping on with us out here in Portland. Uh, you wrote a few articles, one of which caught my interest. How weird it was to be at an SEC media event and no Nick Saban around. Yeah, uh, the entire event was a little bit different this year. Uh, I've been going to this these spring meetings in Destin's for many years now. And it, it was strange. Nick, Nick Saban's absence was certainly felt, um, particularly just because, you know, we're at this kind of inflection point uh, of the sport. And with the, the recent house settlement or house versus NCAA settlement, uh, you know, th- I think there was kind of, I don't know if there was necessarily a leadership vacuum there, but, you know, Saban was certainly leaned on for many years as kind of one of the, the sage voices in that room and, and Kirby smart has kind of ascended to the throne there um, in his mentor's absence, but it certainly was strange. Plenty of folks talked about it. uh, And it was, you know, one, one of many things that kind of occurred this past week in Destin. Well, and then looking at that program going forward, they obviously get Kalen DeBoer from the Northwest, from Washington. Um, What do you think the expectations are? We know there's still a ton of talent on that roster. They're bringing a lot of guys back, including their starting quarterback. But you get Georgia in the regular season. You got kind of a tricky road non-conference game at Wisconsin. And now with the SEC kind of shaking up their schedule a little bit, you not only have to play Georgia, but you got to go on the road to LSU and then on the road to Oklahoma late in the year. So it's going to be a challenging slate for them. What, What are the expectations from Alabama fan? Is this like, just smooth sailing, no bumps in the road? Are they okay with a bump in the road? How do they feel about the board going into year one, you think? Well, I, from an Alabama fan's perspective, they're, they are not expecting any sort of slippage. They, they believe that, you know, and, and I strongly believe that Alabama landed a hell of a coach. I, you know, I'm, I'm higher on Kalen DeBoer than most when I released my coach rankings out earlier this year. Um, I had him in the top five, and I think that surprised some folks. Uh, because a lot of folks just think he's been a kind of a one and done guy, and you know he's had success. He is he literally just do, he does what you want from a head coach. He doesn't lose. It doesn't matter what level he's at. He just doesn't lose. And outside of the COVID year, he really has not you know suffered losses at all on his resume. Having said that, there's a reason why you know other folks I think are a bit skeptical that Alabama won't miss not only. Nick Saban, but the likes of Caleb Downs and Dallas Turner and Kool-Aid McKinstry and those guys, many of whom are either off at the NFL or, or, or Downs who's now at Ohio State, you know, they have a win total that's, that's under 10 games. Um, and that's, they've never won fewer than 10 regular season games since 2007, which was Saban's first year. So it's been a long time. The schedule you mentioned is difficult. I think the fact they get a couple of these big games, Georgia, you know, at home, they get some buys before some of these other difficult games. We'll see. I think, you know, they're probably a 9-3 and three team competing for a playoff spot. But I have Alabama as a potential championship contender. It's just really what sort of leap can Jalen Milrow make from the quarterback position. This is Jesse Simonton on 3.com. You can find his great articles online. Find him on Twitter at Jesse R.E. Simonton. Uh, you know, reading through what happened at the spring meetings for the SEC, I, I'm always interested because they're – they're kind of the trendsetter, right? Whatever they say or they do seems to kind of be the biggest thing in that sport. What's, what's your biggest takeaway, I guess, from talking to people on and off the record at this event that you mentioned? It has grown quite a bit to the point where now it feels like next year this is going to be a massive moment in college football in the off season. What are some of your biggest takeaways of where the sport currently sits and is going talking to people on and off the record? Well, I, I, I wrote about this. I think, you know... Uh, Part of what happens at these meetings is that, you know, we like to talk about football, but that's not really what they're there for. They're, they're there to kind of set out the future parameters of the sport, as you kind of laid out there. And Greg Sankey, the SEC commissioner, is, is arguably the most powerful person in college athletics right now. With no commissioner that kind of governs the sport, it's, you know, really either him or Tony Petiti at the Big Ten. Sankey's been around longer. Sankey has kind of wielded his power. 
you know, it, it, more vigorously, I think. And so what the biggest takeaway kind of walking away from Destin is that there's just so many unknowns surrounding this settlement and what it's, what it's going to mean for the future. You know, a lot of the SEC coaches, football coaches, you know, kind of went on a, um, a grandstanding tour of, of not wanting to lose walk-ons. And, you know, is that in danger? Is that not in danger? That, that right now that it's TBD. You know, but it's something that there was a lot of uproar about, um, really from the consensus. And a lot of times you don't get these coaches, you know, to kind of uh, unite or agree on everything, but that was the case. What's going to happen with Title IX? You know, obviously there is going to be some sort of explicit revenue sharing, but how how all this is impacted, uh, there's still just so much gray that it was kind of interesting to hear from the coaches and athletic directors and school presidents all acknowledge, again, some on the record, some off, some background, what have you, just how much this week was really about education and almost setting a template for, okay, if this is what the decision is or this is what the finality means, we do X. If it's this, we're going to do Y. Um, so they're just kind of really, you know, playing for a bunch of contingencies and then waiting for the, the next shoe to drop. Interesting. Yeah, I know it's one of those things where it's so fascinating because you don't know the direction of the sport, but then also I feel like fans almost get frustrated because all we end up talking about is this off the field stuff. Like we did this last summer with the Pac-12 dying, and that was a nonstop conversation. And everybody was so excited just for football to get here so they didn't have to worry about this stuff, even though it does impact the sport that we all love. On that note, I do want to ask you just on the field this year, I think there was fear when the playoff was expanding that it was going to lead to just blowouts. And look at the college football playoff history. It's been nothing but blowouts. Well, then last year you get these great games between Michigan and Alabama, Washington and Texas coming down on the wire and then a national championship that was kind of a surprise maybe for some at the start of the year. Do do you feel like we're trending in that direction in the sport that there is more parity at the top? Or now maybe that Saban's gone, is it just Georgia's going to run over everybody on their way to multiple national titles? Like, how do you feel about just the way the the top of the sport is shaped up and how that's going to impact the college football playoff? Well, I do think that every team, because of the transfer portal, does not have the depth that we have seen from these behemoths uh, even from Georgia a couple of years ago, all the way back to let's let's say some of those you know um, late aughts, early two thousands uh, Alabama teams. You know I, I think that the depth is just not the same um, one through eighty five because you have seen whether it's some of these five stars or some of these guys transfer for for immediate playing time nil and, and the transfer portal affect that. Having said that, now that we are in in a world where it's a 12-team playoff, I actually think the number of teams that can win a national championship is either the same or has shrunk because we're now talking about teams having to win. And I've written a bunch about this, and I feel pretty strongly about it. I don't think people understand that teams are now going to have to win 15, 16, 17 games to win a national championship. Long are the days where we're going to see a lot of undefeated teams as well. I think it's just it's the body blow theory. Um, I don't think it's going to quite look like the NFL where it's like a, a 12 and four or whatever, but you're going to see a lot of two lost teams win a national championship could happen as soon as this season. And so I don't think that the field at the top is necessarily worse or lessened um, when you take kind of the macro look. Now, when you kind of, you know, pick nits and, and look at the roster from a, you know, um, well, micro perspective, I do think there's some changes but right now, like I only have, I think Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon, Texas, and probably Alabama would be the five teams that I think could actually survive the gauntlet that awaits. Um, whereas a school like Florida State, they can pick somebody off. A school like maybe even Ole Miss, maybe this is the year. Ole Miss has a ton of momentum, a ton of hype. You know, can can they win three or four playoff games in addition to the SEC schedule they have to play and maybe playing? an SEC championship game, I don't see it with that roster. Uh, but that doesn't mean they couldn't win a game. And so that's maybe the difference right now. Yeah, good stuff. Jesse Simonton, On3.com. You can find all his articles on On3.com, on Twitter, at Jesse R.E. Simonton. He joins us. He talked about the, the SEC. He's got a lot of really good reads from the SEC spring media sessions that they held, as he mentioned earlier. It has grown quite a bit. You can find it on 3 
uh, com. Jesse, thanks for hopping on with us this morning. Let's uh, let's catch up maybe when fall ball gets around and you know see what you're writing about at that point once the camps open up and the season gets closer and closer. Thanks for hopping on with us this morning. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right, there we go. Great stuff. Jesse Simonton on 3.com has got some good reads uh, up there, and he joins us on the Daily Ticker. An early ticker this morning, of course, brought to you by Pelican Brewing Company. Visit pelicanbrewing.com for details, locations, events, and award-winning beers independently brewed since 96. Pelican Brewing, born at the beach.